welcome to the new episode of How It's Built. Today I'm talking to James Thompson, an engineer behind PCALC app. We covered quite a few topics ranging from how to succeed in iOS community, to what it takes to maintain software for longer than a few years, and we even discussed how to reverse engineer a calculator. You will notice that this interview is a bit longer than usual, but that's because there were so many interesting topics to discuss. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Without any further ado, here's James from Peacock. It's my calculator at Peacock, and it's 20 years old this December. Um, and it was originally written when I was at university because I wanted to learn how to program the Mac. And I thought, well, I'll pick a small thing that I can do like over the summer, and that will be my sort of learning app. And it was never intended to be something that continued on this long. Um, and it was, it was originally written, part of it was like, I was trying to get jobs. So it was like, if I, I figured if I wrote something and at the time I gave it away for free, um, it would be, you know, uh, a good calling card that I could point to. Um, and yeah, it, it started out then and it was written in Pascal and it was written on uh, Mac Classic. So same shape as the original Macintosh with the, the tiny black and white screen and the graphics were originally black and white. And then there was some grayscale and stuff like that. So it's kind of, uh, it's seen one, two, three processor transitions through Apple at this stage. Um, it's not written in Pascal anymore, but there's still some of that uh, old code still exists uh, in, in what's currently running on your phone or watch or television or whatever. That's a really good point for anyone who is looking to start their career, uh, you know, having some sort of project that you can point to, you know, if there is a link to the app store or something like that. You know, it doesn't need to be like a full app that you're selling on the store. You know, if people have done, you know, open source work or something that they can just point to and say, here is the thing I made, which is not to say that you should work for free. But, you know, it, it was a good um, sort of, uh, it got me a job, at, at least, I think that. So. You, you mentioned that there is some code that is roughly, you know, age of some of our viewers that still runs on the phone. What, what kind of code is that? What, uh, which parts of the app are still there? Okay, so, so I need to sort of like go into the, the history of how it started. So it was originally written in Pascal in 1992. And... There wasn't really much UI framework at the time. Um, most of the UI was completely custom stuff that I was doing. Um, it, it stayed like that for eight years. And it, it was just like, I wrote it once and then left it alone. Um, but when the uh, OS X was coming out around about 2000, um, I, I again wanted like a, a, a small project and that's what Peacock has was originally was this small thing that I could work on. And uh, I took the Pascal code and I basically hand translated all the logic of the calculator into C because that was the, next, the best thing at the time. And then there was basically a C++ wrapper around that. And I was using uh, Metroworks Code Warrior had a framework called PowerPlant. Uh, and that's what I had used uh, because I, I worked at Apple for a while, and the two the last two things that I worked on were written using PowerPlant as a framework. So that was um, uh, a Disney print studio, which some people have heard me telling stories about, and the original Finder uh, for Mac OS X was also MetroWorks PowerPlant. Okay, are those the projects? So you worked on Disney uh, Studio, and you also worked on, on the original Finder? Yeah, so for the Mac OS X version of the Finder, uh, I, I was mostly working on the Mac OS X doc. Uh, the code that actually shipped for the Mac OS X doc was none of mine, but it's, there's a long story there, which we will not bore regular listeners with. Uh, but that was kind of, I was used to using uh, PowerPlant for a lot of stuff, and this was the Carbon framework. So you could write an app that would run on traditional uh, Mac OS, like Mac OS 9 and Mac OS 10. And at this point, Mac OS 10 was very rough. So a lot of people were sticking with Mac OS 9. So it made sense if you could write a project that uh, worked on both. Um, and that was, yeah, that was 2000. And that was the point where I started uh, selling uh, PCALC. And I originally had um, 
uh, so yeah, it'd been given away for free. But in the in the interim, I'd also done a, uh, an app called Drag Thing, which was a, another application doc kind of thing, which was how I ended up with doing the, the Mac OS X doc. Um, and that was, I was going to rewrite that, but I wanted to do something small. Uh, so I did the, a rewrite of pCalc using PowerPlant. And that went along uh, for a while. And then uh, PowerPlant was getting a bit old. So I was like, well, it's time to rewrite it again. And I wrote it uh, using the HI Toolbox APIs, which was still Carbon. And this was 2005. Uh, and in 2005, one of the, the things that Apple introduced was uh, dashboard widgets. And uh, these were mainly done, they were basically HTML JavaScript things. Uh, and you know, you could have a little widget which you bring up. And I'd had a lot of requests for pCalc as a, as a dashboard widget. And all my logic code, uh, you know, it was native code and I didn't want to rewrite it all. Um, but one of the things you could do is you could have a, a native code plugin for the um, these dashboard widgets, which integrated into JavaScript and you could make calls from JavaScript through into native code. And I'm going somewhere with this, I trust, trust me. Um, and so I wanted a pure C, C++ plugin that had none of the HI toolbox code in it. Because uh, uh, this stuff had to be, I think you had to do it for 32-bit and 64-bit. So if you were linking against any of the carbon mm -hmm. stuff, you couldn't do 64-bit. And so I, I jettisoned everything bar the actual pure logic of, you know, push this button, what happens, you know, what, what the display should be. And uh, I had this simplified uh, code. And come 2008, uh, the iPhone SDK came out. And I realized what I could do is I could take the dashboard widget code and I could put that on the phone and then I could write a fairly small UI kit interface to it. And I'd never written any app kit at this point. So my first objective C and all that was uh, learning UI kit. Uh, and I took that and that became the iOS app. And uh, the first version was pretty simple, but it, you know, I iterated quite a bit on it. Then the Mac code was getting uh, quite old at this point and uh, you couldn't do a 64-bit carbon app because Apple had announced that they were going to do 64-bit carbon and then had killed it a few years later. And they were clear that the future was all app kit. So I took the UI kit app and I ported it to the Mac. Uh, so all the classes matched and most of the stuff below the UI level was, was the same. And that was kind of how I ended up with this core code that I was trying to use everywhere. Um, and it, I was kind of like, this had come out of like the, the side of doing this dashboard widget, uh, which was like completely a totally minor thing and not call to anything else. But the fact that I'd done the work of, you know, making it not depend on any of the other frameworks that were there meant I came, I now had this super portable uh, little uh, calculator engine. And I then, as time went on, I realized how, how powerful that was as a thing. And I became, I wrote this uh, wrapper around it. So there's like wrappers around wrappers around wrappers at this point. But so I have this calc engine, which is an objective C slash Swift encapsulation of all the core code. And that's now used across every platform in widgets, Siri intent, watch app, TV app, everything all runs the same piece of code. Um, and it, it was really an idea of trying to isolate all the technical debt that lies in this uh, old piece of code that's 28 years old and to sort of insulate that from the, the UI framework and the app and vice versa. Um, and, and it was getting to the point, some of that core code was like, I would look at it and it's like, I wrote this when I was like 18 or 19. Uh, it's bad. Uh, I have no idea how some of the stuff works. <laughs> and 
like there, there was one thing that I had to change because I realized there was a major problem with like the order of operation. So like you want things to like, so the multiplication will happen uh, before adding and things like that, like it, like C operator precedence. Um, and it was just broken and had been for like 20 years. And <laughs> I was like, this isn't good. I need to, f I mean, it worked. I don't want to say it was broken, but it was like, it was quirky. Um, <laughs> And so I had to go in and rewrite that in the core code. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I am literally going to have to just strip out this whole thing and rewrite it from scratch because it is too, I, who knows what I was thinking when I wrote it. And there's a lot yeah. of the code deep in that core where it's like, who knows what I was thinking. That's a really, really interesting history for an app. I don't think that there are too many apps right now that have like as reach. I mean, I'm sure that like, you know, like, yeah, maybe if you like, pull up Finder or, or some apps that's like been there for a while, uh, you can probably find many of them, like many of the uh, historical choices there. But that's that's really cool. And it's going to be an interesting story that like the clean architecture, you know, the clean separation of concerns for you came naturally from uh, just from the understanding that you have to split the UI and have a portable logic. And so uh, have you played with kind of with uh so you mentioned that at first you had a kind of c, c c plus plus core uh yeah have you considered building some sort of uh web based uh calculator because that's like the the rage these days when people like do wasm or what's not with from c plus plus yeah i mean the thing is with the uh, the core code while i say it's like completely isolated it still has like under the hood, there's there's still like a lot of core foundation stuff going on, which means that it's basically stuck to Apple platforms as mm. a as a thing. So you know, there's like uh, CF strings and stuff okay. like that under the hood, which then become NS strings when you're actually using them or or whatever from from the outside. So you know, when I say it's super portable, it's like super portable. So long as Apple made it. Let's say that you you would start building this app from scratch today. Um, how, like looking back at, you know, some decisions are there kind of for historical reasons, how much of that architecture would you carry over or would you like start completely from scratch and use some different approaches? I, I think I would start from scratch. I mean, what I'm doing at the moment is like, as I come to like change something down in the sort of like the the lower levels, you know, the archaeology of the app. It's a case of try and rewrite it to to do it in a, a sensible way. Um, but you know that there are still, and this is a you know a terrible admission. There are still some Pascal strings like deep in the heart of the code. Um, I, I made an analogy. I don't know if you've ever seen Star Trek the motion picture like the original first mm -hmm. Star Trek movie, because that has like this big alien probe that they meet and they discover that it actually started out as the Voyager probe that was sent out from Earth and then had all these different layers built up around it <laughs> until it become this big sentient monster. That is basically <laughs> my code base. Uh, but I mean, like the, 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 this is, it's a big state machine is the, uh, is the code. And there's, there's a big old C record that has the live engine state and you know there's long doubles which are for each sort of register of the calculator um, and all functions that i'm calling into modify the state machine but uh there's also there is support in there for things like uh save the state of the calculator to a property list, basically an, an NS dictionary or, you know, load, load from an NS dictionary. And that's used in a lot of places for like saving and loading state, but also undo redo and various things. So I've tried to make uh, a modern sort of interface to things, uh, but without breaking existing code that is, is working. It generally, I mean, most times rewriting code is bad because you're just going to end up putting more bugs in it. You know, if you have code that works and has worked for a long time, you know, I'm going to be able to compile C, I think, for the rest of the, my life. You know, it, Safe assumption. It doesn't need to be written in Swift, rewritten in Swift, for example. You know, hmm. so long as it can be used from Swift and the interfaces are fairly Swift-like, 
it doesn't matter what the core is written in is the way mm. I'm looking at it. Um, and I know there would be people who would be like, oh, but, you know, if you rewrote it in Swift, it would be, you know, so much nicer, concise, or you could do these things, but it works. And, you know, I, my uh, time is better spent in the higher levels of the app, because I think that's to some extent, that's where the value of the product is. Um, and yeah, I mean, in terms of like how this, the, how it works, a, this engine that I, I've built is every action that you would perform, uh, in the calculator is a function. So, uh, it tries to be a black box. So it tries not to let things like the, um, the long double type escape from, from it. Um, so so there's a function called, like, say you'd say handle six, which is what you call when somebody presses the six button, handle times, handle seven, handle equals. And that's you just telling what the user is doing. And then there's another function, which is called uh, copy LCD state as property list, which will return a dictionary, uh, which describes what the, 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 I called it an LCD, but you know what what the display of the calculator would be so that's got like the 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 strings that are the the digits uh or each individual line because the calculator can have multiple lines and there's like some things that can be lit up like to show that there's a um, uh stuff in the memory if you think of it like an old lcd display and like so you're you're basically lighting up little bits of the display mm -hmm. and this is all in this uh, dictionary that you get back. And uh, there's a custom UI object which can display one of these dictionaries, and that's what it does. Uh, and I use that code pretty much everywhere as well. Um, but because I've got this code, which is sort of very high level, and also you don't need to, there's, a, there's another routine which will just get you a single string which represents the main uh, display of the calculator. So, like, if you think that you to get, to get this running on a new thing, all you need to do is wire up the buttons to pressing or calling these routines for handling the buttons, and then you get a, you can get a string which represents the display, and that meant like I could get it running on uh, WatchOS in like ten minutes. You know, that's very cool yeah it can be like a text-based adventure type of game if you want to like nothing well i mean it. like the, the other web place that i use this is uh in the siri intents so you know i can have a full calculator running inside the siri intent that can share its state with the main calculator so you can uh if you are running a siri shortcut or something uh it can do all this stuff that the main thing can do and it can just modify the state of the thing write it out to a shared bit of disk and then tell the main calculator, I've updated this, go on. And that's the same thing that I did with the widgets because um, I had a notification center widget on Mac OS and iOS. And now the new widget architecture doesn't really let you do interactive stuff quite as much. Uh, so I've moved the Mac code to be in the menu bar. Like it's just like a little menu bar widget, but mm -hmm. it, it was literally, I could take the same code uh, and just put it up there. And it's very good that I can just like write stuff out as a property list, uh, no, send a cross uh, cross process notification, and say I've updated this. If you want to have a look, uh, yeah, and stuff like that. Uh, so it's nice because the code is uh, very low impact, so you can put it anywhere you like. Yeah, much. Yeah, it's very cool. Can you talk a bit more about the state machine? So can you give an example of the state uh, that state machine was going to have at any given moment? So if you're doing, uh, say, entering a long calculation, uh, like I was alluding to before about the, um, the order of operation. Uh, so if you think of a calculator and you're typing in something and you, you might put in brackets because you want something... Uh, evaluated before it goes off and, and adds it and, and all that. So when you're putting stuff in, when you're just typing it in, it basically does this and puts sort of implicit brackets in. And then that will sort of, that calculation will get 
uh, put on a stack. And then, you know, when you need to work out what the answer is, it will sort of solve all the little bits and then go down and then, you know, expand out and give you the, the final answer. So there's, there's like, there's an array of uh, little stacks that have got partial calculations on them that as it comes in, gets evaluated. Um, there's, there's, there's like state for when you're just typing in a number, like uh, that's at that point until you've actually hit a return. I think that's a string. Um, and th there's like lots of little weird behavior that you have to sort of uh, deal with. Uh, so there's a lot of like flags, like saying the last thing that you entered was a uh, 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 whatever, like if you if you did a, a calculation like you did uh, six times seven, and then you hit the return again, you would want to like well the last thing you did was multiply by seven, so do that thing again, and mm. so it's just like keeping all all this sort of state, um, and there's other things there for um, if you're running functions or conversions or whatever, um, it can do stuff like it will run like you, you can run something on using this engine uh, and then like revert the state to what it was before. So you can get the answer and then it's like, well, the user hasn't committed to doing this, but I, I know I'm wanting to find out what the result of this thing is ahead of time. And then I'll just sort of undo that and go back to the previous state. Mm. And there's, there's things like the, there's a, a virtual paper tape, uh, in the, in there as well, and so that there is a sort of tape object, which is a, an array of things that the user has done, which is kept. And I can ask, I can request that from the high level and say, "Can you give me the the state?" Mm -hmm. Also, undo and redo is in there as well for similar things. So I just go down and tell the tell the lower level thing. I can say, "Can you undo?" And if you can undo, undo it. Have you looked into how you know, like some sort of classic, like Casio or whatever, scientific calculators are implemented behind the scenes. How much does it resemble that? Um, so like I had a, one of these original Casio calculators and when I went to make PCALC in the first place, I basically reverse engineered, like if I do this, what what happens? You know, why is it doing this? And as I said, with the, the operator precedence, I got it completely wrong. Um, but uh, I haven't looked into how it is implemented underneath, like, like, actually implemented the one of the things um that I, the reason for making this uh, sort of separation and not trying not to leak out the the numeric types out of it is that i've had this long running goal of replacing it with something that is uh at least like not necessarily new code but replacing the the core numeric types with something else um, something like, because you can occasionally, you can run into things using floating point numbers where you can't represent a number exactly. So you'll end up with, if you ask for it with enough uh, decimal places, it might end up, you know, like uh, 41.9999999. And that's not great. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in generally in real terms, it's not too bad of a problem, but it's something that, weighs on me that I think I, I know I need to do this. And that was, in fact, that was one of my plans for 2020 was to do that work. Funnily enough, 2020 is not really gone as many of us expected. <laughs> and uh, my productivity was not particularly great uh, and for a good chunk of the year. What I did was it was like, um, you've got a house, but you'd really like it to have an extra story. So you just sort of like jack up the house and he slide in this uh, abstraction layer and then like remove the jacks and hopes, hope that it still works. Um, <laughs> it is because, such a brilliant analogy for engineering. <laughs> and it, it was like that because uh, a lot of the code was calling into this engine, not going through a nice uh, uh, abstraction layer, but going through the, a C API effectively. And I wanted to get rid of that. And I did that a couple of years ago um, and it, it was a lot of work to make sure that it, it all worked properly, but it was much nicer because then I've got code that is really easy to use from like Swift UI and things like that. And 
now that I have this separation between the two, I can make changes to the lower stuff and be relatively confident in it. Um, it we'll, keep, we'll come back to sort of testing and stuff later. Um, but but yeah, so that, that that's the goal. Is And I would recommend anyone that's doing this sort of stuff is try and like have an abstract a layer as an interface from your UI code to your logic code. Um, because it just makes it so much easier to uh, makes it more flexible in the future. Because like when I wrote this stuff, uh, I did not envisage that it would be running on a watch on my wrist or or whatever things like that. A little aside, I'm curious, how do you reverse engineer a calculator? Because I know how to reverse engineer like an iOS app with you know like tools like Hopper to Assembler, etc. But how do you reverse engineer a calculator? It was purely sitting there and pressing every single button and like all the combinations and just trying to like, I just spent a long time like, like how do calculators work? Well, I don't know. Let's, let's, I've got this sort of reference thing here. Let, let's just go through it and see. And I mean, I, I had like some uh, textbooks on, on sort of mathematical stuff and like how to implement various functions because mostly i use apple's um, maths libraries for doing stuff but you know that you come across functions that there isn't an equivalent for in the library so you just have to implement that using uh using other stuff right um so i i mean it wasn't a reverse engineering in the in the reverse engineering sense i guess it's more like a clean room thing where you're, you're 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 not looking at any of the code but you're just seeing how it works yeah i think that's that's a really cool exercise actually because yeah like i'm, I'm more used to just like brute force you know let's crack this thing open and kind of look inside uh, yeah. where this this is like a, such a brilliant exercise as far as just un, like how do you implement something that you, you only yeah you have a black box and you know like the results that it spits out but you need to kind of figure out everything else on your own that's that's really cool yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff is sort of good learning experience. I mean, like when I was doing it, it was like, I had no idea. What, like I was like, I was two years into a computing degree. So I had some basic stuff and I'd done programming before that, but um, I'd never written a Mac app and uh, I'd never written something this complex. A lot of my work to that point, we had like exercises where you would do things like, you know, here's a text file, read in the text file, do something and write out another text file you know we, we weren't doing any ui programming at that point so your app is known uh to have this really vibrant collection of visual styles that's going to people can you know customize to their preferences so and you already alluded to the fact that ui is separated quite a bit from the actual core maybe you can talk a bit more about the ui when i first started um on ios uh the phones were p relatively powerful but you know still you know, slow compared to what we have today. And I built it first in the simulator because that's all we had at that point because I didn't have a phone of my own. Um, I eventually ended up with a jailbroken phone because I don't think they were even available in the UK at the time. So, um, sorry, Apple. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I built the UI kind of similar to how I built the UI with PCAL at the start, which was just using images. So I had PNG files for each button, which I had done in Photoshop. And I, um, when I did it, I created um, basically a UI button for each button and uh, set the, 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 the image. And I built this in, in uh, the simulator. When I actually ran it on a, real app, on a real device, I realized it was horrendously slow, um, partially because there was a lot of, I was doing it in an uh, interface builder and there was a lot of overhead of like sort of just instantiating this big thing. Like, so the app took 10 seconds to start up on the phone. And I was like, I, that's terrible, you know? And I think I, I, with like weeks to go before the, the uh, iPhone launch and I finally got hardware, I was like, or, or the, the app store launch, I should say, um, I like ripped it all out and I wrote completely custom code. There's two parts to this. There's the visuals and there's the layout of the buttons, for example. And they're both done with uh, plist files. So, so sort of you load it in and it's array of things. So with the layouts, 
you've got an array of buttons effectively and their placement size and various metadata about the buttons. Like for example, you know, what's written on the button and what, if it uses an image uh, and what function that it should eventually call uh, when you press it. So there's that. Um, and there's also uh, another set of things which will read in the, the theme. And so I, I came up with, instead of using PNGs, which worked, were fine, but anytime I change something, I'd have to redo all these images. And, you know, like if the font changed, it's like, well, I then need to have another hundred of these images. So I had like hundreds and hundreds of images that get loaded in, in various states, you know, like is the button enabled or not, or is the button selected? So it just, you know, would mushroom out into lots of images. And when I'd written drag thing, which was my app launcher, it had had themes. And back in 2000, I'd written this theme engine, which the way it works is it kind of mapped uh, quite closely onto core graphics calls. So you could, it would be a list of, say you wanted to draw, draw a button, it would be a list of instructions to draw a button in a certain style. It would be like, uh, you know, create a, a rounded rectangle and fill it with a gradient and then do you know, this other gradient on top of it or whatever. So it was these list of things. And that's how I did all the themes and drag thing. And I realized that that code was quite flexible and it actually ran really well on the phones. Um, and so I moved, I just pulled that in as is uh, into the into the code and it works. And, you know, that I, I've thought many times about building like a visual editor for, for the stuff. And I just got used to like editing these um, files uh, in, you know, either in Xcode or, or just in BB edit or something like that, if I wanted to tweak something. And it's like, if you want to draw a button, here is a list of instructions to draw a button in this theme. If you want to draw like whatever, um, it just works. Um, and that code, it's not running on the watch yet, but you know, it's probably only a matter of time. In fact, with the watch, I've uh, uh, recently I've been working on a Swift UI rewrite of the watch, um, and uh, that's not using any of this theme stuff because you know Swift ba Swift UI basically has a similar sort of set of primitives for doing graphic stuff, which is very, very much like the way. So when I was doing the um, Swift UI uh, widgets for for one of my other apps. You know, I, I just use the same concepts, but doing it natively in Swift UI. Um, but I I kind of got into the way of like, if there's something that you're going to have to configure, just stick it in a an, in a property list and uh, in a dictionary, and that and make it very flexible. Uh, and you know your future self will thank you for doing it like that. <laughs> it seems like themes and and subject of you know like customizing the UI was like you can appreciate it. It's early on, and you're gonna carry it through different apps. Uh, is there any sort of particular reason, or was it just kind of you 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 thought it's it's a fun exercise? Well, how did you come to that? Um, I, I mean, I think like certainly with drag thing. Uh, Initially, there wasn't much flexibility in it. You could set colors and things. And then people were like, oh, I'd really like it to look like this, or I'd really like it to look like that. And with PCALC, it's like people say, oh, could you make it look a bit like, you know, an old Casio or an old uh, whatever? And it's like, well, I don't want to make it too close because I don't want to get sued. But yeah, I know what you mean. Um, and, uh, and it was helpful, like, so... I'd gone through this partially when I was at Apple because the way stuff was implemented, they would do themes behind the scenes for stuff. Um, so you would have primitives, very much like what I was doing for drawing a button, you know, uh, and this was exposed through the uh, HI toolbox, but it's like they had a, a theme engine. You could say, if you just wanted to draw a thing that looks like a button, call this routine, pass in the parameters to it. Um, which means like with iOS or Mac OS or whatever, if the theme changes, like so when we had iOS 7 or iPhone OS 7, whatever it was called at the time, um, 
you know, you you could you just need to change the theme, and then you can come up with something that looks nice for the for the app. And I've never, I mean, I've. I don't want to say I've always thought I can do better than what Apple does because that sounds terrible and I don't mean it like that. But, you know, like I want to have more control over how something is rendered. Um, and so I've, I've always done that kind of like uh, my own interface things for doing stuff. Um, and like with touch handling, for example, like I wrote my own way of handling the presses so in pcalc if you like put your finger down it'll do multi-touch so you can press multiple buttons at once and it will it'll re react better like a real physical calculator would than if i was just using a ui buttons for everything things like that so um it's an interesting just as an aside i think it's an interesting thing to do as an experiment is to try and replicate OS behaviors. I mean, most of the time, like you should try and use what Apple has provided. Um, but it gives you an understanding, like doing um, uh, gesture recognizers and things like that, and trying to, like, how would I implement this thing? Like I did in, um, in my other apps, uh, which I'll get to. I'm just referring to my other app, but it's Dice by Pico, is what I'm talking about here. But uh, I, I wanted a pop-up menu control, which doesn't exist on iOS. And it's like, mm. okay, I want this because I want it in Catalyst and I want it uh, in iOS. How would I write a pop-up menu? Because, you know, sounds simple enough. And it's like, it's not. There's like tons of edge cases and weirdness and you want to scroll it in a particular way. And it's like, okay, so I'm going to lead like four or five gesture recognizers working in different ways. And I can kind of get close to how this would work um, for, for the way Apple would do it. And, and trying to do that stuff, even just, you know, making buttons or whatever, uh, it makes you uh, appreciate the work that Apple does a lot more because you discover, oh, there are these edge cases. Like the classic one is if you have hierarchical menus, uh, and you, you're like, if you just clip off the end of one as you're coming off one going into the submenu, you don't want it all to close. So you, you can't just do uh, the naive way of implementing it. There are these like little subtle things that have been there mostly since the start of you know uh, the Mac in 1984, which you might not appreciate, but it, it's worth doing all this stuff, like uh, implementing things yourself to see how things might work. Okay, first you had to do like your own state machine inside of touches. And, yeah. and that's what my touch handling is. It's all completely custom. It doesn't use gesture recognizers. I use gesture recognizers everywhere else, but the the, the thing that handles like just the the, the taps uh, on the on the buttons, that's all custom uh, down to the, you know, the, the presses level of, yeah. of doing stuff. And it's like... Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it gets complicated and you, you want to do things like you want to do press and hold and you want to do, you know, maybe uh, swipes and things mm. like that. And yeah, I, my, my recommendation is definitely use gesture recognizers if you're doing any custom stuff. Don't do it all manually. Um, gesture recognizers, you can do lots of stuff. Like you can say, you know, this gesture depends on this one failing and you can wire them all up and say you know i want this one to run in parallel with this other one and, and this one not and yeah yeah uh, it's it's a, it's a lot of fun to do that stuff um you know just i think as a as an exercise um and i i was like doing similar things like because i've been doing 3d stuff and it's like how do you do this stuff in 3d uh, and again that you know becomes uh, that's a it's a fun challenge can we talk a bit more about the how do you represent numbers? Because it's a notoriously like you kind of mentioned the floating points issues and all that. How do you represent the numbers now? And and if you have any sort of uh, thoughts, thoughts, what would be the ideal implementation of that? Be uh, so like at the moment they're represented as I said earlier with long doubles. Is is the basic type that's down there? What I want to do and the plan is to replace that again, jacking the building up. I want to completely replace all that with my own custom type, which would enable me to represent them in different ways as you, 
as you use them. So like, for example, if you're just using doing currency stuff, you know, you might want to use a decimal uh, type in there, or you might use an integer when you're just dealing with pure integers. And to have the logic of, well, if I'm multiplying these two things together, what's the best way of doing that? And, you know, and then you'll get out of it a number which is the best representation you could get. And the other thing that I want to look into is perhaps instead of doing all that, I would use some uh, open source third-party maths library in there. Uh, Apple uses their own private maths library now, of course, uh, which is used in calculator. And it, I think they're using it in numbers now, but they didn't originally. Um, so it used to be you, you could find these weird cases, um, but then Apple stuff would do exactly the same, you know, in, in those situations. And they realize they must have realized that they want to move away and and do it in a different way. So th that is something that I'm I'm considering as my sort of early next year project is to um, is to do that. Last time I looked at any of the third party math libraries out there that. I think the one that was most appropriate was like part of the Unicode spec or something like that. But it's finding a library which has all the functionality you want and can be used in a commercial application, right. which, yeah. you know, a lot of the open source stuff uh, is not compatible with that, shall we say. Yeah. Um, but there, I mean, there is a lot of sort of BSD licensed and whatever stuff out there. Somehow I'm not even surprised that Unicode has a math library as a part of Unicode. Like, yes, that makes sense. Yeah. So the class, uh, th that class that would represent uh, different numeric types depending on the uh, context, it sounds like a use case for class clusters, like that subjective C concept. Uh, is that something that you're kind of considering as an implementation or is it not necessarily the right way? The thing is, it's like, as we were talking about this sliding in chunks, it's like, what can I do that will be compatible the most with the existing code that's there? Because I don't want to break the logic as well. Um, I don't know is the answer to the is the honest answer to the question, and I'm I'm sort of like it's a, it's a this is a big project because like the the this core code gets touched as little as possible because mm. it, some of it I mean as I, as I said earlier there's there's like the stuff where the output is a nice you know uh, dictionary uh, with you know um, various properties in it but you know somewhere in the code it's passed through a pascal string which has then been turned into a cf string which has then turned into an ns string and it's finding what is the what is the nice what is the nice place where you can start to attack this code and modernize it without wrecking it um, yeah and yeah that, that it that is a is an interesting thing to look at i i one of the the other things that's in there, I'd said earlier, is about the um, the running functions and conversions and that sort of stuff, and that's implemented. This was implemented by me twenty eight years ago. Um, I came up with this like it's kind of like assembly language, but it's not even assembly language. Um, so there's uh, te it's text based. So each line of the of of a function would be something like you know set x six mul x seven which you know it, it's just like it's like setting registers in in assembly and, and then running little uh, opcodes on them and that is what I used to do the conversions so like a conversion to you know go from centimeters to inches or whatever would just be a multiplication uh, on one a one line it would just be a multiplication and i realized as time went on that this was getting quite old you know this way of doing it and it doesn't have like uh loops or or jumps or anything like that so it's not like turing complete or, or heavy you can't write like you can only write very simple stuff in it. Um, I, I think you can you can actually jump forward, but you can't go back. So I, it, it was de it was designed to avoid infinite loops as a possibility. Um, 
but uh, it's not very flexible. So what I did on the Mac version was I moved it to use Apple Script as the way of doing all these things. And you know, Apple Script, you can do pretty much anything. So you can you know, call out to uh, other apps, get results back, and do things. And that was great. And then the iPhone came along, and there's no Apple Script on the iPhone. And it's like, well, if I want to do this stuff, I actually have to go back and use my old 1992 code. Um, and that's running today still on, on the on the phone and, and, and now on the Mac, because I had to have them in both places. So the Apple script went away. What I want to do again in the, the list of big project ideas is I wanted to uh, move to JavaScript, which is available on all the platforms as a way of doing scripting or something like Python. I mean, there are other things, but mm -hmm. JavaScript is built into the OS as, as something you can call out to. Um, and, and it's like, yes, but I've got this, um, you can create your own functions on, on iOS and Mac. Uh, and there's a sort of visual editor for that, which is, you know, you can create these lines and it is, like a, a, a sort of, um, there's a UI being layered on top of this thing, but it is still generating this low low level kind of opcode based uh, conversion stuff uh, underneath. And it's like, am I going to keep that and have, like, is that going to compile down effectively to lines of JavaScript? Um, or am I going to like just have a text box when you go into edit that's like, okay, now just type your JavaScript mm -hmm. or I'm going to have both, which is what I had effectively with the Apple script and whatever. And it's like, that's another like several month project to do. And it's like, where is the best, what's the best thing to use for my time? Yep. And, and a lot of the, I've got like multiple documents where I keep ideas or things that people have requested. And it's like, I really want to tackle this. And my year tends to be split into two is everything from June through to like about now is working on Apple new OS stuff and dealing with whatever Apple has sprung on us, like at WWDC. And it's like, you know, oh, we're completely changing the UI or <laughs> we've introduced all these new screen sizes or now there's a watch, now there's this. And, and so the, the latter half of my year is very reactive two things you know or apple has changed how siri shortcuts work or apple has done this and this year was especially difficult with all you know pandemic times was just like getting everything working i mean I w i've worked from home for 20 years that wasn't a problem it was like everything that was happening outside yeah was like just impacting on my mental state and making it quite hard to work you know um so I didn't have the typical phase, but yeah, what I was going to say was from January through to like uh, June, that's my work on my stuff time, like where I want to come up with, um, you know, big architectural things that I want to do or other ideas. Um, so, you know, we'll see how it goes in January because, you know, we're still, <laughs> yeah, 2020 will continue for at least six months into 2021. That's um, a good way to put it. <laughs> So yeah. we'll see. Um, yeah, I, sure. I do know two people now who have had a vaccine, their first jab of vaccine. So nice. You know, we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. But anyway, I was kind of um, curious to 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 dig into something a bit deeper. Uh, throughout the conversation, it kind of shows that you were not uh, uh, afraid to mix in the languages, right? And mm -hmm. so, is that a conscious approach to, or is it just did it just happen to be? And then, second part of the question. With you kind of alluded that you might want to uh, look into JavaScript as uh, the kind of macro language for some of the functionality. Any concerns for the the way JavaScript notoriously tricky when it comes to handling math, like math and like numeric operations? Yeah, I mean, uh, so for the the first part of that, um, I think you have to keep learning stuff. That that's throughout my whole career. That's like whenever I do a rewrite of, of an app, it's not because the code needs rewritten, it's because I want to learn how to do it. Um, you know, so if it's like just a pure C-based version of the app or you want to start using different frameworks or you're you know, using Apple's frameworks or, or however, it, however you go, it's like very important to not 
I mean, some some of this code is stuck in the past, but it's important that you that you know how to do things. So, like, um, I've been learning Swift UI over the the summer and and autumn because I used that for the um, widgets, and I also used it in uh, Dice for doing a preferences dialog because I wanted to make a in a Catalyst app the easiest way to make a nice uh, well, one of the easiest ways to make a nice Mac UI is to use uh, Swift UI, which maps natively onto the, the AppKit controls. Um, and I had no Swift UI experience. I have some limited Swift experience. Like as I've added some new parts to the app, I've done them in Swift. But it, it's mainly not to rewrite old stuff, but to keep up with all the older stuff. And it means your app does, or my apps anyway, end up a sort of uh, patchwork quilt of all these different bits. But, you know, it works. And uh, it, it's all about learning. And then when you make the new app, you can maybe take the more modern concepts and, and do stuff like that. Um, for the, what was the second question? Yes. So the, the, the fact that you want to use JavaScript, do you have any concerns? Like, uh, yeah. I mean, like when I use JavaScript with the, the, the widgets, like the dashboard widget back in 2005, yeah, that was, that was an issue there. And that's why I had the native code. And it might be the case that not, not to use the, the math stuff, but to be able to sort of call into like, the native code from JavaScript. That's kind of the way I'm thinking mm, of okay. it. Um, so it, in a way, just to sort of like, because you can bridge between uh, native code and the JavaScript and uh, have a have that as an object available in the JavaScript. Uh, so I think that might be the way to do it and you could do your own thing, but then it, the, there's like, oh, maybe I should use Python instead, or mm -hmm. maybe I should use something. You know, JavaScript is just ubiquitous, um, but yeah, it's not great. Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. But it's it's an interesting uh, solution to have this jump off point. As soon as you get close to math, you like jump back into native land. Also, yeah. yeah, Python is known to be used quite extensively throughout scientific community, and there are many, many libraries that cover all sort of calculations with any sort of yeah. level of precision that you might ever want to. Yeah, that's... yeah and, and Apple historically was quite um, uh, against uh, interpreters and pulling in code and things like that. And it's like, I'm not 100% sure what their stance is on some of that stuff at the moment. I know it's looser than it used to be. Okay. It used to be the case of if it doesn't ship with the OS, then you can't yeah. use it. But, you know, nowadays that's not the case. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, but I know, you know, people like Pythonist or whatever, they've run into, they ran into like this stuff uh, early on. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, it, and a lot of the stuff uh, just from a higher level is like, what do I want to do? You know, like there's, what do the customers want? What is possible? What do I want to spend my time doing? Yeah. You know, and and it, it, these are all trade-offs against each other. Um, you know, uh it's well, the, there's just me writing code that like our company is myself and my wife and she handles like all the sort of um, anything to do with money and all the businessy side of things. And I handle the, like the programming and uh, the like support and, and PR side of things. Um, but I don't have like people that I can give stuff to and like go off and do this and, you know, um, so I have to be quite careful in what I choose to do because I know my time is limited. Like, yeah. Um, you have to consider doing the internships. People would love to intern with you just to learn. I mean, yes. The problem is that I'm a bit of a control freak and I do not necessarily think I would be the best person to work with. I mean, you can ask my wife on that one, but, uh, I, I'm trying, like, with art, I try to outsource art stuff. And I've had, you know, varying levels of success with that. Like, the icons um, uh, were uh, done by a guy on Twitter, Forgotten Towel. Um, and uh, guy on Twitter, it's like, he is a real person. But he he did the icon, and then I took the basic icon, and, like, Peacock has 
hundreds of uh, alternative icons that you can pick. And I did all of those. And I previously, I did all the icons um, with the stickers. And yeah, Peacock does have stickers. It has like a uh, Pascal the Panda, who is our mascot. That was all done by uh, uh, David Lanham, who is a guy that I've really admired his art for a long time. And I realized at some point, because he did, uh, if you've ever used the Facebook stickers, he did like, there was Beast, which was, uh, as it turns out, Mark Zuckerberg's dog. And he did that. And I really loved those stickers. And I was like, wait a minute, I could just pay him money and he can make me stickers. <laughs> and he'd never done a, a panda, like a proper panda. He'd done a, like, bunnies and dogs and red pandas and stuff. And it's like, how much would it actually cost to hire an artist to make me like a range of 24 animated stickers? And I was like, he, he's actually very reasonable. And, and I recommend people uh, use him. Um, but even with that, it was like, well, you're animating, you know, like half a dozen of these stickers. I'm going to animate the rest of them, you know, it's like, or I'm going to draw this. And he was very patient with me. Like, I want to learn how to do 2D animation. So I'm going to do this or, or, or however we, we did things. Um, and so that I would like, I will, I will put it as a collaborative process whenever I have people working on stuff with me. Um, they might see it as me being picky and overly controlling. Um, so yeah, it, it's difficult to get somebody else to touch the code, um, I don't know how well that would work. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of this stuff might might well change, but but having like, as I say, you know, limited time and wanting to kind of learn things and be constantly moving is uh, is kind of how I've done stuff for a, for a long time, and like. Um, I mean, we can segue into the about screen of Peacock, which is the, I, I did a whole conference talk on basically why this is here, uh, which, you know, if you want to stick in the show notes or whatever, um, it was called an illustrated history of Easter eggs. And uh, it came about partially because uh Ever since I first used the Mac, I had seen the Finder About screen, which has a little secret About screen where you get the scrolling credits of all the people who'd worked on the Finder. And back then, this was 92, it went all the way back to like the Lisa days. And it was just like, all these people have worked on this thing. And I wanted to get my name in there. And that was like, from like the start of seeing this, it was like, wouldn't it be cool if I was one of these people that worked on this? And eventually I ended up working on the Finder and I ended up being the person who was implementing the Mac OS X version of the Secret About Box. And I took the, the names that were there for the Mac OS 9.1 or whatever it was, that no, was 9.0, I think at that time, uh, Finder, took them out, added in all the people who were working on the Mac OS X Finder and added my name in. And it was like, and you held down the option key or whatever, selected about the Finder and you got the scrolling list of people. The next week, Steve Jobs ordered that all credits be removed from the operating system. Like you couldn't have names of engineers anywhere or Easter eggs or anything. And there was a, there was a discussion as to, there was, a, there was a reasonable rationale about this was that uh, not everybody who contributed to like Mac OS X say, would have their names in there. Um, this would come down to like people who were doing like uh, project management or who were doing you know, down to the level of the, you know, the people that kept the offices tidy, you know, the company had lots of people who were involved and why should it only be like a group of engineers who got their name in a thing that makes perfect sense. There was also a reason of that was not stated that they thought people would poach, you know, engineers and it's like if you can point to it and you can say oh you know here's a list of all the people who wrote this thing we, it would be nice if we could poach them for our company so um i was like quite upset that i had got so close and i had, i had my name in that window which had been my goal for like the past i mean at that point six years or whatever was to be one of those people uh and then it was taken away 
I was like, right, I am going to write the biggest and most ridiculous about screen secret about books Easter egg that has been done because I've done a talk on this, I know. And so uh, Peacock has what's... So the background of this, I wanted to do 3D stuff uh, because it's clear Apple is looking at AR and uh, 3D as the future. And it may or may not be the future, but Apple is investing a ton of uh, engineering time into this. We may see, you know, augmented reality glasses it might not be next year. It might be five years or 10 years away, but it's something I wanted to know how to do. And so there's the scene kit APIs, which is Apple's kind of quite high level um, 3D uh, stuff. And it's high level to the point of like, you know, make a ball, give it some weight and, you know, uh, material appearance. You know, you can make it shiny metal or whatever and put it in this 3D world and it will work, you know. And uh, it's really simple to use. And I recommend anyone looking at doing 3D stuff on Apple platforms anyway to look into. Works on the watch even. And so I basically went through all the APIs and it was like, okay, so let's make a, a 3D thing. Let's light it. So I had a 3D version of the icon, which you could mess with. And then it was like, well, let's try some physics so you can throw things at it and just, it's fun. And then I was working my way through the, like literally going through like all the different classes available in scene kit was like, well, here's stuff for doing, you know, custom geometry, here's stuff for doing, you know, materials, whatever. And there was one and it was like, um, I think it SCN vehicle. I was like, Ooh, vehicle. That sounds interesting. <laughs> What's that? And it's like, well, you know, supply a geometry, supply four wheels, and then you can like turn the wheels and you can do stuff. And I was like, Ooh, that seems fun. <laughs> and I've tried to make a game for many years, like my entire career, and I never really made anything. And uh, so I bought a 3D asset of a little truck and I wired it all up and I made the wheels and all of this. And I could move this truck around. I could like literally drive it around this scene that I'd made. And I put a ramp in, you know, and gave it the appropriate, you know, um, physics uh, stuff shape. And I drove the car at the ramp and it hit the ramp and it flew through the air. And I was like, this is the best thing I have ever written in my entire life. It was just such a visceral thing, you know, I, cause I had created this. And so I messed around with all the APIs and there's like, there's a whole city you can explore off this uh, about screen and you can do stuff in AR and you can have calculator that works in AR and all, all this stuff. But it was like, I put it together with these, two things which was what do i want to learn which was i want to learn all this 3d stuff what do i want to work on this stuff is fun um but i also wanted to make a silly thing and also this was 2016 which was um the time of the brexit vote in the uk and the us elections and it was that was for whatever your political beliefs they were both momentous changes and uh, I needed something to distract myself. And that's what I spent my time messing around with. Uh, 2016 yeah. was doing all, all, all that code. Yeah. Um, and I learned a lot of stuff from that. And I, I spun off a, a bunch of that into, I, I've done this Dice by Peacock, which is a, it's an RPG dice rolling app. Um, and it uses all the same sort of 3D physics stuff that com comes from scene kit. And I made a watch version and a TV version and all this. But it's also, it's my catalyst and Swift UI thing. So like where I was using um, uh, PCalc as my test app. So my main app was Drag Thing back then. And I would use PCalc as a, let's try out a new framework. Let's learn how to do stuff. Now I'm using Dice as my small app because PCalc is, huge at this point um, and is my main income uh, it's like could I use Catalyst or Swift UI as the basis of a future Mac and iOS and whatever version so I'm coming at that from a few different angles so like I've got a half written Swift UI version of the watch app which um, was really simple to get up and running uh, 
but is Swift UI the best? I mean, Apple clearly thinks Swift UI is the future of Apple development. Is it something that I could make a great app with that I could do all I want to do today? I'm not sure. Is Catalyst the way to do that? I'm not sure. But it is a way of exploring that stuff. And, you know, Dice app is simple enough that I can I can do stuff and I can experiment with things. And people will look at it and it's like, you know, why are you spending your time writing a, a, a RPG dice rolling app? And it's like, it's like the about screen. It keeps my mind fresh and young to do something new. It makes me happy, which is like good um but it's it's the it's a place to experiment with stuff and if and i've made a what i think is a nice product project uh nice product as well that people like but it, it, it it's a it's a way to put some creative energy into something different and keep yourself fresh and, and working on things yeah, that's, that's a good different. point. Uh, having uh, like velocity is really important when you just want to experiment, learn new technology. You don't want to, like experimentation in the established code base is so much harder. There are so many yeah. decisions that you have to account for. Uh, one topic I want to touch real quick on, or maybe not real quick, um, the testing. You can uh, called out several times throughout this interview that your UI is super independent and you have an engine. Let's talk about testing. I have some testing of the the core engine um which is good so you, you know i can i i know that stuff generally is working there um what i don't have is good ui testing um like the it is easy to do to do it on the core stuff because you as i say it's a nice interface to it you can do all this stuff you, you know what you're trying to get out that's easy the UI testing I have always found a lot harder to do as a, as a like for for doing stuff like um, so, so there's a layout editor in Peacock, which is a very visual thing about you know how you can move stuff around and, and move the buttons around, create new buttons and all that. And honestly, I don't know where I would start on doing UI testing on that stuff. And the approach that I've taken with testing on that is like having a lot of beta testers and just sort of throwing stuff over the wall to like 500, a thousand people. And somebody's going to come back and say, Oh, you completely broke this. Um, I would say, I highly recommend having uh, people who use voiceover and various other assistive technologies in your beta testing pool. That is, super valuable because there's been a number of times where I've broken uh, like uh, voiceover stuff, which is not, you know, obvious to most people using the app, but if you've broken that stuff, you make it completely unusable for somebody who's using voiceover. And it, that was the point where I, I, I was like, I need to, I need to absolutely have people testing this who, who use voiceover. Um, and it, and it, a lot of the assistive technology, I mean, there's, it's not, you know, just for people who are completely blind or whatever. Um, you know, I, I used like the, the, um, the assistive zoom stuff all the time because I'm using it to zoom in, to look at tiny details on the UI. Uh, you know, is that pixel correct? I can zoom in and I can look at it and it's like, and yeah, there's a standard example of like so many people use subtitles on like uh, Netflix or, or whatever kind of thing. It's, I think it's important to say lots of people use assistive technologies and you should absolutely support them and oh, you should sure. support voiceover yeah. and all this stuff. And, you know, a lot of the testing, the UI testing stuff is can be built off um, uh, the uh, voiceover stuff you know that's how it kind of can drive the ui mm -hmm. and things like that but i am not great at doing ui testing i'm not the best at doing even the the, the low level testing you know i know that that's an issue that's a, that's an issue that is an area that i want to improve on yeah um, and it's it's again it's like a lot of these things it's like especially when you're in charge of like all the things it's like i need to redo the website 
like I need to, my website looks like it was designed in the nineties because it was designed in the nineties. <laughs> and uh, I need to move that to WordPress. I need to do this. Um, I need to get a manual written. And it's like, I managed to do that. The manual needs updating. All right. Well, I could spend a month updating the manual, but then, that's, so it's, it's all like, um, I always think of this stuff. It's like, you know, you're playing some RPG and it's like, how many points do you put into this? Um, you know, oh, I'm going to put lots of points into this stat, but then I'm not very good at doing this. So, and, you know, it's all your, your um, ability trees. And, 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 you know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, you've got a limited number of points. How do you spend them? How do you yeah. do this? Yeah, it's a balancing and, act for sure. Uh, so to, to the point of unit testing, uh, how, and you kind of mentioned that you have like this highly custom approach to UI. How much work did you put into making it accessible with all the like labels and, and shapes of buttons that you kind of you have to be more explicit about? Um, I, I tried to make it like as, as good as possible on that stuff. So, you know, there are lower level um, APIs if you're doing custom controls or whatever. You just need to adopt that stuff and you need to make sure that it works as well as, as the other um, UI elements do. Again, this is, a, it, as we were talking about earlier, it is a nice uh, exercise, you know, is to learn what do you need to do to implement for a fully custom piece of UI enough voiceover um, stuff or the AX stuff. Um, so I, I try to do that and I try anywhere that I'm doing custom UI, try and make it as accessible as I can. And I know I can do it better. And I'm sure there's somebody listening to me who uses it, who's like, yeah, but you've, this has been broken or whatever. And it's like, well, tell me, tell me that I got it wrong. Yeah, um, for sure. But and the, the unit testing that you have around the core, uh, the example of uh, moving to a different numeric type, do you think that existing tests would get you like would have you give you a good start of like i changed the numeric types completely and it still works i know that it works yeah and that's the thing and that's like i've moved to a different processor architecture for example you know when it, it wasn't as much of a big deal uh with the m1 max because all that code has been running on arm for like 10 whatever it is 10 years um but yeah if you moved to like first time moving to ARM or first time moving to Intel from PowerPC, you know, it's, it's good to have at least some sanity checking that everything kind of works the way you think it works. Um, but yeah, so I think that, that my plan is if I do start the, the replacing the, the core types is to do more extensive unit testing on the, on that level so that I can, I'm, you know, it, it's always hard to write unit tests that cover everything, but yeah, it, it's it's something that people should do, and I know I should do more of it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a common theme across all the guests of the show, where some people say that they have no testing at all, but they know how important it is. So, like, there is not a single person who was here and was like, "Oh yeah, we got like our testing done. It's good." So, I don't think it's. it's I, I mean, I. I I just think what it's like if you're somebody like Facebook or you're somebody like whatever who's, or even Apple themselves, you know, I, I know people who work on like core UI components of like UI kit or, or whatever. And it's like, yeah, you make a change there. You're affecting like a billion people, whatever, you know, it, it's like, a, you know, there's enough people that use PCAL. It's, 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 you know, relatively popular but it's like it's not on the the it's not at the hundreds of millions range or you know the the billion range um probably not the 10 million range if i'm honest but you know it, it's the um yeah you you, you want to make sure the stuff is is right when especially when you're rolling it out to larger numbers of people um I mean, I can imagine just the the efforts on bringing up stuff on the M1 Max must have been huge, uh, the people who were working on that. We touched several times on the fact that the app uh, is pretty much on every, every Apple platform that's out there. Um, mm. Can you cover, can you talk a bit more about what's the, what would it go into making it truly cross-platform in kind of Apple like a system sensor? So I try and share as much code as I can between the platforms. And for some things, 
that's relatively straightforward. So everything like under the UI, you know, as we're talking about all the networking and all stuff like that, that can go anywhere. Um, anything uh, a UI level, you can do stuff like a lot of things exist on both, like gesture recognizers that not always work exactly the same. But um, core graphics is present. So like if you have code like my um, theme code, that will run easily anywhere. Um, there's a there's a bunch of stuff, even where it's it's effectively you're taking like something that starts UI and replacing it like search and replace for NS, and it it just kind of works. Um, I so the the most of the code like so so the like there's some things the more modern stuff that I've written I try and write it such it will run anywhere so like the 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 code that displays the like the output of the calculator that code is cross platform and some of it is done by uh you know there's some like hash if target os mac do this specific behavior because drag and drop works differently on this bit or or whatever um I, for the for the dice app because it's catalyst um the same code is running everywhere but it's also running on the watch um and that's very powerful because it means you know um you just need to scale down the graphics quality for running in a situation like that but you have all the 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 app logic is running and then you just need to have the with the 3d stuff like the scene kit stuff is very portable so you can have like the same code running uh, mac tv ios watch os whatever um then you can query like effectively how good is the graphics card on this thing and then i will i have various levels of well i i'll use these features if I'm on this kind of graphics card, whatever. Um, but then on top of that, you you have to put a UI onto it. Uh, like, so because I'm using Catalyst, I can use the same code between the Mac and, and iOS there. Um, WatchOS, I've got a uh, watch kit and I can probably use Swift UI now on that stuff. Um, and, and it, it's finding like the, the 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 place where if you're doing too much of the cross platform thing, like particularly between like iOS and macOS and things like that, between AppKit and UIKit, if you're having to do too many like hash define whatevers uh, to to make it work and cross platform, it can make the code very messy. And uh, so it's finding the level to do that stuff where you're you're not introducing too much problems I, i've had problems like even with xcode not parsing correctly like or not doing highlighting correctly because it's just got confused because that's when you know like, yeah it's like back away now this is this is not uh it's not good um and uh, yeah so it's, it's finding the, the the right level and i mean i've not done any cross-platform stuff for ages between like Apple and other systems. So, you know, if I, I, I have no great desire to make an Android app, um, mainly because uh, as far as I can tell, nobody buys apps on Android. Um, that's probably a simplification, but like there's a lot more, there's a lot more people willing to spend money on Apple platforms than there are on other platforms. And from a, you know, running a business point of view, and, and also as we we're talking about not having the time to learn lots of stuff, uh, it's better for me to to specialize um, in that, but uh, yeah. So I've never done that level of cross platform, uh, and I I have great respect for anyone that does because it must be a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, now with <laughs> JavaScript, you know, it's it's so easy; it just works. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we've seen how good some of the um, Electron apps have been on various platforms and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's definitely it's still a challenge. Um, all right. In closing, I wanted to touch a bit on the kind of business side of the story. You made it sound as if this is pretty much the main the main source of income. And uh, to me, for example, it's not immediately obvious. You know, you have pretty much built-in calculator app into every 
well, almost every platform from the ones that you can have mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, so talk, can you talk a bit more about the business side of this project? Yeah, I mean, when I started out, uh, as I said, I was just making stuff for free and putting it out as freeware because I just wanted to like build stuff, learn how to do it and try and make a name for myself such that I could get a job doing it. Um, and later on, um, I had a friend who was, he did a, a, an app that gave themes, in fact, on classic Mac OS. And he made a, you know, he, we were talking about it and he made enough that he, it would keep him in Apple gear. You know, he could get a new laptop each year out of it or, or whatever it was. And I was like, that seems pretty cool. So I drag thing had been freeware for a long time and I made it shareware with one of the big updates. And because uh, it had been out for a long time and lots of people knew about it, same with PCalc, there was like people, enough people out there who were willing to actually spend money on it and, and buy it when it became shareware. Um, and PCalc got bundled with uh, the Angle Poise G4 iMac in the States. So I, I had a deal with them. I got money uh, for every single one of those that got sold. And there was, I, it wasn't a lot of money per unit, but there were a lot of units and that was quite a good deal. Uh, but it meant that there was like lots of people who'd had that machine knew, knew about Peacock. And, you know, the Apple calculator came along sometime like the next year or whatever. Um, they just didn't have something at the time, like a, a good scientific calculator. And that's why they put Peacock on. Um, and so it's difficult for me because I think the reason that I am successful now is a lot of luck. And because I was successful in the past, you know, so it's like, how do you become successful? Well, you be successful 10 years previously. And that's like a impossible, like I was, a, I did a lot of things where I was in the right place at the right time, or I had the right free thing or whatever, and it caught on. And how, to replicate that, I don't know. Uh, and I don't, you know, Peacock, like if you have a discussion about calculators anywhere, somebody like on whatever platform, somebody will mention Peacock. And it's like, that's great because, you know, it means people know about it and people like it. And there are, like, if you search for calculator on the app store, there are a lot of calculators. And, you know, some people like an exact emulation of some old thing. Some people like the more sort of, um, algebraic based ones like that are solving, you know, like sort of mathematical level of solving things. And there's everything in between. So why is Peacock a business that I can like uh, make money on and like supports myself and my wife and is a good business? I don't know. I am very lucky to be in this position. And I mean, I think part of it is also visibility. Like I try to be relatively well known and um, not be an asshole, you know, that sort of thing. And I'm on podcasts and whatever. I think the product is good. I, you know, I think that's part of it. I don't think if it was bad, I could just be in the position that I'm in. Um, but why, you know, why is it, why is it a success that is, you know, has endured this long? I, I think it's luck, privilege, a lot of a lot of things like that, and uh, some hard work. And yeah, I, I don't know, but it, I mean, it, it's it's like it it is supporting us. It's a good living. Um, if it all dried up tomorrow, I would make something else. Um, and you know, I mean, I mean, it's not that I'm trapped doing it, but but it is like Peacock is like my my main income, and like Dice was a, is a nice little side thing, but it, it's a you know it's like ten percent whatever of our our income for the year basically, mm -hmm. and the other like eighty the remaining it's like eighty percent is probably well the, the is majority is iOS. Like that was the thing that really took off for PCALC is like when you could actually have it in your pocket, like a calculator would be rather than like sort of a, a thing on a screen um, that made it into more of a thing. Uh, and yeah, that, that was where it took off as, as a financial thing. And 
drag thing at the time was going down because like it was competing with the the mac os dock which you know i did work on as well but it, it's like you i could see like the the money for drag thing going down and the money for peak out going up and it's like well i need to spend my time on peak out because that that's that's the income that's where things are and drag thing never made it past 32 bit because it was um carbon app and mm -hmm. rewriting it to um app kit i mean it's possible and some of the things exist today but doing things on the store through um, um the sandboxing is hard to do you know if you want to write a system level utility which effectively that is it gets harder every year and Calculators are nice, simple, self-contained things. You know, you can put them anywhere. It's not doing anything that's going to throw up dialogues saying, why are you trying to send an Apple event to the finder? Or are you some kind of malware? You know, which seems to be the experience if you're trying to do system level. And you also um, keep reinventing yourself in a way with every new technology. You're going to keep updating, you know, the app. Yeah. And, and I think some people like just the dumb things that I do occasionally, you know, it's like the, the, you know, the about screen actually got like, the, um, there was a Mac stories review of just the about screen. You know, <laughs> That's I, I, the live goal right there. That, that was like, I was so happy with that. Uh, yeah, no, for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of that about screen. I remember when, when I saw it for the first time, I just loved it. And to, to your point of like the class of SCN vehicle, like my favorite class is SCN banana on, on fire, that one. <laughs> yes, yes. I think it's a combination of factors. And yeah, I, 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 but I do think I was lucky. I, and, and part of it was like, because I've been doing this so long, you know, stuff has been around and, and that is hard to replicate. You know, if you're coming into a market just with a new product, but I think that the thing that people can do, and I have seen people doing this is like, be part of like the Apple developer community and like it's a very I find or I have found that it's a very nice community and like people generally help each other even people who work on competing products I had this from the beginning like when I was working on on drag thing it was like all the people who wrote docs and launches and, and all this stuff we were just like how did you do that and it's like, oh, I did this, you know, here, have some code. Oh, like, nice. And people would share. And it's like, yeah, we're in competition with each other, but there's like millions of people out there. We're not going to sell copies to everyone. So we'll all just like help each other. And, you know, I talked to the the, the Tapbot people who do like um, CalcBot. And they, it's like, we all talk to each other. It's not like there's like bitter rivalry between folk. And I think that's what's nice about the community is like, you get to know people and people generally help each other. And if somebody messages me saying, how did you do this? You know, and generally, well, it's not, I'm not going to say, well, it's a corp you know, corporate secrets. So I can't tell you that. Um, and so that I think is something that is worth doing. And I've, I've seen, um, I've seen developers come into this, like, you know, a few years ago and, work their like kind of work their way up in the the um the community um and i mean they're doing good stuff as well you know but but it but it's it's that combination of being being uh, around and it means the you know if people know who you are generally the people who are like you know in the in the 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 uh, press community or the you know podcasters and, and all that if you're visible they will also see your stuff and then people will talk about you and hopefully good things and and that helps you know get i mean even like this that i'm doing with you right now this is kind of like it you know it's nice to talk and hopefully there's people watching this who are like getting something out of what i say um but you know doing things like this and and sort of being being i don't want to use the word a personality because that sounds terrible you know what i mean yeah no i but, mean like you're still authentic but also there is some level of awareness you know 
there is a difference between just being a genius who works alone in isolation and someone who is, you know, like you mentioned, shares with community and being part of it. Yeah, I definitely would not describe myself as a genius in, in any capacity, I would like to say. Um, but, you know, even just like I, I play D&D on the internet with a bunch of friends and stuff. And 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 that, you know, that, that turned out to be like the this weird, well, not weird, but so there's a podcast I do, Total Party Kill, which is part of the Incomparable podcast. And the Incomparable is run by Jason Snell, who was, you know, chief editor of Macworld, and I've known him for 25 years. And it's like doing that when I was working on the Dice app, because Jason basically said to me, I can't believe you haven't done a, a, a D&D Dice app. And I was like, okay, I'll give myself a challenge. And I gave myself two weeks to write it. Or I gave myself a week, but I did it in two. And I had it from new project to on the store in two weeks. And that was a challenge. Since I don't make that many new apps, like if your apps are like 25 and 28 years old, creating something brand new is is a thing but anyway there's a slack there's a a, a member slack for people who um uh support the the incomparable podcasts and in that there's a channel for total party kill and so i basically used that channel as my beta test and ideas thing so there was this kind of very nice i was like developing it in not entirely in public but you know, I had I had a whole bunch of people who were like, well, this is really good. Could you make it do this? And and it was a sort of iterative, like multiple builds a day going up for these people to play with. And it was kind of like at the end of it, they had an app that did things that they wanted. And I had a, you know, this great collaborative process of coming up with this thing. And that was a that was a sort of a weird sort of experience because I hadn't really done anything like that before. But um, yeah, it, it's like being this sort of like loner in your in your office, like I'm going to create this perfect thing and then I'm going to release it to the world with no other feedback on it. Generally not a good plan. I have been that person. I absolutely have been that person. But it's much nicer when, if you can even like using test flight and things like that and getting good feedback on stuff and developing things, um, developing things more out in the open, I, I've found to be useful. And it's like, yes, there is a chance that somebody will come across your thing and steal all your good ideas. But I think it's more likely that you are, you'll get good ideas from the community. The community doesn't always know best and as i said i am a control freak and you know i will if i if i'm absolutely certain about how something should work i'll be very stubborn about it but but yeah i think i think that kind of that that's the 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 best advice is to like don't like don't be alone trying to do this stuff and you know i mean if you're working in a team as well you also have some collaboration or, or whatever but uh yeah do do the if you're trying to make a successful product in the apple world i think be part of the community uh, be that developer press whatever and you know it's it's harder for some people than others to get to break into that that's absolutely true um but i hope it's a welcoming place um you know for for everyone yeah yeah, for sure. That's that's a really good advice. I think that that's something that uh, new developers, as they're starting up, like that's that's a good advice for for them. Uh, in the closing, uh, where can people find you? Are you looking for any more uh, testers of, with like any sort of abilities? Uh, any sort of closing remarks? Um, so, like the best place to find me personally is on Twitter. I'm James Thompson, and that's Thompson without a P. Um, and peakout.com has got all my apps on it, or, or tla.systems is the company site, but there's not really much on that. So peakout.com, as I said, looks like it was designed in the 90s. But um, in terms of, yeah, I mean, if people have got any comments or, or things like DM me, my DMs are open, as they say. Um, and uh Testers, I tend to like open it up uh, when I have something significant. I'll I'll generally post on Twitter and I'll I'll, I'll open up like the the test flight links that you can give out um, 
and I'll say, you know, I'll just like add another hundred slots and, and get people in um, that way. Uh, but, you know, if anybody has a, a, a burning desire to beta test me, just beta test me, beta test my apps. Uh, <laughs> yes, the, the separation between, you know, the, the creator and the product is very thin, <laughs> I think. It's like, I do find if somebody insults my app, I take it as an insult to myself i should not be this personally uh get all my uh validation from my work but yeah anyway um but yeah you know if, if somebody wants to test stuff just just let me know lovely well thank you so much for you know all the time that you spent uh sharing the history and really interesting bits about peak i really appreciate your time thank you so much well i hope you can edit this down into something useful <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks.